The Lord be with you. We begin our worship with the invocation, invocation and the reading. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and to not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. In the parable of the persistent widow just read, you heard a tale of two judges. And I don't know about you, but I find the parable both very disconcerting and a great consolation. The story is very disconcerting because the unrighteous judge seems to be the new normal in our morally challenged culture. Commentators point out that the judge was not Jewish because the Jews of the time settled disputes with three elders. So most likely, he's modeled on a paid magistrate of the Romans, and such individuals were typically corrupt. As Alvin Schmidt explains, the dominant ideal in Roman cultures was liberalitas. That's the idea that gifts and favors are to be given to those who can repay you. And this would explain why the judge has no interest in the widow. She has no money, no power, no influence, and she's not related to the judge in any way. Under liberal liberalitas, justice is only done if there's a suitable reward. It's not something held desirable in itself. And so in this context, the odds of the widow getting justice are slim indeed. But surprisingly, she does. But the reason is not that the judge has a moral breakthrough, but simply that the widow's persistence creates an emotional cost that the judge does not want to pay. The judge is apparently what philosophers call an ethical egoist, someone who believes it's right to always pursue self-interest. And because he finds the widow's persistence wearing, he grants her justice for the sake of his own emotional comfort. This is disconcerting because so many people today in positions of authority are just like the unrighteous judge. They appear to neither fear God nor man and do the right thing only as a last resort because it would make them uncomfortable not to do so. Think of insurance companies denying valid claims managers who renege on their agreements and contracts whenever they can get away with it. And think of politicians more interested in scoring points against a rival political party than in addressing the actual concerns of citizens. In fact, the situation of many people today is worse than the widows because we have a politicized media and it refuses to report the cries for justice from quarters it disagrees with rather than officials doing the right thing to avoid being beaten down, their justice continues because dissent is gagged. So that's the part of the story that's disconcerting. There's a hideously corrupt, self-centered judge, and he's an all too familiar figure in our allegedly more enlightened society. And yet, the parable isn't told to upset us but to encourage us so that we always pray and do not lose heart. The parable is a great consolation 
because it also talks about a second judge. While the earthly judge will only grant justice for the wrong reason, our heavenly judge is eager to give justice and to give it speedily. God is unlike the earthly judge in almost every respect. It's in God's very nature to be righteous. Justice is part of who he is. So God will do what is right and do it for the right reason. But he's more than a God of justice. He's a God of grace. The fact is that if God gave us what we deserved, he would punish us temporally and eternally. But instead, while we were yet sinners, God sent his son. Christ lived a perfect life that we could not, bore the load of all our sins, and paid their wages by death on the cross. In a great exchange for bearing our unrighteousness, God gives us the righteousness of Christ. Thus, when God gives justice to the elect, it means they receive not punishment, but their eternal reward to live forever with him. Unlike the earthly judge, God does this knowing we have precisely nothing to give him in return. And even though, on account of sin, we are unrelated orphans, he gives us all of this out of perfect love, not liberalitas, but caritas, which is the Latin for agape love. Caritas seeks nothing but what is the best for the beloved. On account of Christ's work, he adopts us as his sons. So we are members of his royal family, a royal priesthood. Our response in gratitude for this incredible gift is to reflect God's love to others. And when that happens, we lose the liberal liberalitas that gives because it seeks a reward and we find the caritas of God is working through us to serve our neighbor. And what is the conduit of this great gift? The text hints at the answer right at the end. Faith. This is not the faith of the unrighteous judge that he can engineer his own comfort in life. It's the faith of the elect who have so completely lost faith in their own righteousness as filthy rags, that they cling only to the righteousness of Christ. And what helps us to hold on to that gift? Many things, but one is prayer. When we give up thinking we can fix all of our problems, we will find ourselves praying, throwing ourselves on God's mercy. Sooner or later we will lose heart if we put our hope in the world's justice, but not if we depend on the righteousness of Christ.